delighted to be here, and I am honored to have been invited. So I've got a lot of slides tonight, so for a change, I'm going to have to speak fast. I might even have to skip a few things. I'd like to start out, I will explain more about my photography a little later on when we get to that section in the films. But I wanted to point out here my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather, Paul Van Cleve Sr. and Alice Davis Van Cleve. She was a very well-educated woman. She spoke five languages. She wrote. She also was a mover and a shaker, and nobody got in her way. <clears throat> she wanted to uh, move the capital to Big Timber. She <laughs> Uh huh, and she wanted to have the uh, railroad moved from Big T or from yeah from Big Timber to Melville, so she managed to wine and dine politicians, and she wined and dined them so well that uh, she ran my great grandfather into bankruptcy, and he lost the original ranch. She was something, I'll tell you. <laughs> And this was the Butte Ranch, the original ranch uh, out there at the base of Porcupine Butte. There was the big building, uh, the original house that had, they say, 38 rooms. She was determined that every one of the five daughters, my grandfather's sisters, uh, would marry a man who was either had a title or money preferably both. So she attempted to get the, this was a Scotsman who married the youngest daughter, and uh, that house now has, nothing remains on the place anymore. Uh, it's very sad to me to see this. The only thing that remained at the time I made this shop was the Jack Scarlet house, the Scotsman who married the youngest daughter. Uh, this was a part of the original stables there. They had um, two polo fields, one indoors, so I heard, and one outdoors. They had quite a life. They played a lot of games. <laughs> This was my grandfather, and this was uh, Mabel, can't quite read the, Mabel Powell. She was a world-famous violinist and a oftentimes guest to the ranch. They had costume parties. I can't believe it. I never grew up with that. They really knew how to live over there. Aha, uh -huh, they did know how to live. You take a little picnic, you find a huge stump, put a tablecloth on it, bring your wine and your cheese and your bread and everything. These are three of my grandfather's sisters, and this is Jack Scarlet, one of the husbands who had title and a little money for a while. <clears throat> they played polo out there. And the women all were first-rate riders. I'm and they had split riding skirts. This was one of my grandfather's sister, Alice, and uh, Dad said she could ride any horse she could corral. And well, she had a couple of husbands too, uh, mainly because she didn't pay too much attention to them. <laughs> And I love this picture that shows three four-horse teams moving the Beinecke house from uh, the upper part of my grandfather's new holdings when he rebuilt the ranch. He lost the old, his father lost the old one, and he had to rebuild and get a new ranch, which he did. Uh, they were crossing the swollen sweetgrass creek there in a ranch buggy. Must have been an exciting trip. And here, much older, uh, this was uh, my grandfather, great grandfather, Paul and Alice Davis, uh, celebrating their twenty their golden wedding anniversary, and my grandfather there. 
He was a remarkable man, my grandfather was. <clears throat> uh, this shows my sister Shelley. We are branding the same way they did in the old days. We held the cattle in the corner. And then a little bit later on, when guests were not so interested in chasing cattle, why uh, we had a little fenced-in area. It wasn't terribly little, because we always roped the cattle and dragged them to the fire. This is my brother, Tack, my middle sister, Shelley, and I don't know where Carol is, but somewhere. These are my grandparents, Helen Perry Van Cleve. She was raised in Helena, and my grandfather, um, Paul Van Cleve. He was a great man. And in those days, they're moving horses, the dude horses, down to the home ranch in 1942. He had about 300 head of horses, about 400 head of cattle, and 3,000 head of sheep. And you know, my granddad said, well, when cattle prices are down, sheep are up. And when sheep are down, cattle are up. So we stayed with that, but then there were some years there in the early um, 1900s when both were down. The markets were really bad. So they moved into guest ranching, which I showed you those earlier pictures of the parties at the old Butte Ranch. <laughs> they knew how to entertain people. And in those days, their guests came and stayed forever, it seemed like, and never offered to pay for anything. So my grandparents thought, we're going to go into dude ranching. That will help. It's just another crop. But uh, we still raise a lot of horses. Oh, we did. My mother and my father, Barbara Van Cleve, and dad, Spike, and this up Big Timber Canyon, of course. <laughs> This was at a, a wonderful rodeo and horse race. You know, we used to have tracks, race tracks at every place that had a rodeo, it seemed like, in the old days. And here in Big Timber, we had a quarter mile track, and then it moved into a round track. You go around it twice, and you'd have half mile. Well, <clears throat> my granddad... Had he loved thoroughbred horses? Dad was quarter horse man. My granddad was a thoroughbred man, and then we ended up producing um, uh, the cross quarter horse thoroughbred cross. But at this day, my granddad had said we were going to have a matched race, and I was going to ride this little hot headed. <laughs> thoroughbred mare. She was a cute little thing, but she was hot-headed, spooks. And uh, the man who was going to race backed out at the last minute. So my granddad said, well, people have paid. They want to see a race. So uh, he went over to my little sister, who was sitting with the rest of the family, and he said, oh, Shelly, you want ice cream cone? <laughs> so Shelly, yes, yeah. so she went with him, and uh, Scrumper then put her on Johnny Bones, his big old thoroughbred horse, and he told her what to do and what was going to go on. Well, I have to tell you, uh, I only beat Shelly by a nose, and she just continued on around the track until Johnny Bones ran out of steam. And by that time, Mother had worked up a good steam about the whole affair. <laughs> but since Shelley didn't get hurt, why, everything was fine. Oh, uh, yes, and I did jockey for my dad in those years. And that was when Chief's Big Pete, he was a quarter horse, and he held the world record for a quarter of a mile for, I think it was five years, five or six years. And this was, uh, I believe this was photographed in Big Timber. We had a good track we had, but no more. 
like a lot of ranchers, <clears throat> Dad not only loved his teams, but he used them a lot. And uh, it seemed to me that you were awfully close to the back end of the horse at one of these sleighs. But they used to, the ranchers would trade off and come around to the grade school, pick us up, then come around, get us, and take us home again when the weather was, well, we had plenty of snow. But when I was growing up, I always heard the first snow in October is the last to melt in May. So we had a lot more snow in those days. I was... Uh, I was not only a redhead in those days. You know what happens when you get older? Redheads go to the kind of a roan or plain old gray. Uh, but you see the tripod back there and the backpack. I was shooting with a, uh, a uh, view camera in those days. Um, I started out getting into photography because I couldn't draw and couldn't paint in our little one-room schoolhouse, and I wanted to show people how great ranching was. I loved it. I still love it. But I feel the cold a lot more than I used to, particularly as a kid. But I wanted to share. We got... Uh, Life magazine in the house, and Life magazine was a photographic magazine or picture magazine. And um, so I thought, gee, maybe that's what I need, a camera. So I begged for a camera, and when I was 11, mother and dad gave me a camera. And that was my medium. That's what I used. So I am... 100% a self-taught photographer. I read everything I could about photography to teach myself the essentials of it, how to develop film, uh, how to print, all of that, but most importantly, how to see. That's the big thing, the eyes and the heart. And I think maybe they both have to function together. Here you have my sister Shelley with uh, her youngest, uh, pardon me, her oldest at that time, myself, and then my sister Carol, at a branding, of course. And since I am built close to the ground, I always had to find some kind of elevation, climbing up on something. And you'll note this is a... Four by five, it's a crown graphic camera that uh, one of the guests at the Dude Ranch was a magazine photographer, newspaper photographer, and he died. And his wife came the next summer and brought me his camera and all of the equipment, which I thought was a lovely, lovely thing because I, I could carry that camera on horseback. I, of course, I had to stop, open it up, pull the lens out a little bit in order to shoot. It's not like 35 millimeter, but I got some really wonderful big negatives. Yep, on a post again. <coughs> Oh, finally, I took to just riding a horse and using 35 millimeter all the time because I could carry that camera with me. However, I had to shoot with the fastest film, which is Tri-X, which had an ISO of 400, which meant the grain was quite large. The little particles of silver halide were quite large in order to capture more light more rapidly. And when I make some of my prints today from 35 millimeter camera, I look at the grain and I think, oh, oh. particularly when I blow them up to 30 by 40 inches. And now that I'm into digital, I'm, I'm kind of a snob. I look at that and I think, oh, how could anybody want that picture when you can see the grain? Oh, well, they do. See? 
This is on the set of The Horse Whisperer. I was one of the three still photographers, kind of special photographers. We were invited in for um, a few weeks at a time to shoot. Uh, I sure wouldn't want to be a, a person who shoots on movie sets. It's a hurry up and wait kind of thing. But it was a beautiful day there. This is from one of the 4x5s. The state of Montana bought it. And this is all I had left, which was a postcard. And you can see that terrible grain pattern from the printing. Then <clears throat> I moved. I, I thought, I hoped. I dreamed of being a photographer, and mother and dad said, you cannot support yourself being a photographer. You better learn something else. And mother really pushed me into education, so I got a degree so I could teach grade school and high school. And I went back to a, a Chicago area, and I got a master's degree. I was working on a master's degree there. But I also was shooting for a number of textbook companies. And that kept me very occupied because they give me a story and tell me they want it illustrated. How did I think the story should look? So I had to... Um, get models, set it up. After I talked to the art director, and she or he had decided how they wanted me to approach it. And I used all my friends all the time as models. I think they got tired of that after a while. This was not a case of models. These are pictures from... Um, cantonments or reenactments that took place around in the Chicago area. This was Galena, uh, Illinois, and there are several of them. This was over, in, I think, Indiana. This was just the lakefront there in Chicago, and the trees intrigued me. Oh, yes, and this is back in 1963, the hippie area era. And this is down on the lakefront there in Chicago, blowing bubbles and watching the baby and just having fun. And this is uh, Gloria Steinem when she appeared there in Chicago. I was very pleased with this shot because it was such a low angle shot to pull in some of the audience. I have a number of shots that are much closer of her, but don't have the dra dramatic kind of a feeling that this does. I was just learning how to really photograph. In this, I was in the Canadian Maritime Provinces. <clears throat> This is at the very top end where they harvest the kelp from the sea there. And they drive these horses with these big wire buckets into the sea, get the kelp and or seaweed, and then they will either dry it and sell it or they will sell it wet. Um, right now, I've forgotten exactly. It was 12 cents a pound dry, I think, and 9 cents a pound wet. It's, it's something. Felt for the horses. And they were haying up there using the old method, which always intrigued me because when I grew up, we hayed using horses. And there were some exciting things that went on because my grandfather wasn't a big one for completely training a horse or breaking it. He figured, he said, if you use them long enough, they'll get into it. 
Well, uh huh. <laughs> but I saw a guy on the, the mower on the ranch didn't have wheels like this. They were just much smaller rubber wheels, and he sat up so high on that seat, and he just had the reins. That's all, and a handle to raise the mower bar or lay it down and I don't know what got into that young horse but he just pinned his ears back and took off like the devil himself was after him and that sickle bar was just up and down popping up and down and I thought oh the poor rabbits and everything that are going to be mutilated well finally that horse settled down and just stood there panting and uh my granddad said, he'll be fine now. <laughs> and we had buck rakes, and then we, you know, had overshot stackers, loose hay, uh, all of that. A lot of work in those days to do that. I wonder what people are doing with all of the time that's saved. I suspect it's watching football games on TV. At least it was for my dad. <clears throat> this is the first photograph I made that was really significant. This is, I made it when I was about 15 with the brownie box camera mother and dad gave me. And I was on a hunting pack trip with dad. And we were up over on the south fork of Big Timber Creek. Ha! Huh beautiful meadow, just lovely. We made camp that night. <laughs> Next morning, we woke up with about a foot and a half of snow on our sugans. And Dad said, well, it'll be good for tracking. So we got breakfast and everything, and here came the wind. And then a ground blizzard. And he said, we'll just have to call it a day because we're not going to be able to do anything. So we packed up and we're headed out. And to this day, I do not know why I got off the horse to come back to get into this position to make the shot. Because I remember saying to Dad, I, Dad, wait, wait, I've got to make this photograph because the wind was obscuring the willows over here and you could see it kind of piling up here, the darkness of the snow. And he said, well, all right, get a wiggle on, he said, because it's colder than a brass monkey's tail in a Klondike. <laughs> so we did. This is a four by five taken on the divide between Big Timber Creek and Sweetgrass Creek, a lovely area. And I, I carted that four by five camera around for a long time. I, I loved it, but it was very frustrating because it was a 125 millimeter lens and I had no way, it was good when you were up close to something, but when I was trying to get a more scenic uh, thing seen, uh, it was just, everything was so small. Uh, it was very frustrating. So I got a 35 millimeter camera and I began and I began to trade up cameras. I'd never trade a horse, but I always wanted to trade cameras, trade up to get something better and better and better. <clears throat> I taught myself to see composition and design by pasting a piece of red cellophane across the viewfinder. I had read Ansel Adams' zone system, and that was going from pure black to pure white, 21 zones. So you could deal with where your the density of the image lay. Well, when I put that red cellophane across there, I went from pure red to pure white. And that, to me, was fascinating because I could begin to see design 
and see the whole elements of composition. And that is so important. And it's almost second nature now. I'm going to show you a number of pictures that have those features in them, I think, quite strongly, that make a, a, a photograph that's interesting. This is in line camp. <laughs> this is uh, one of the horseshoers, our horseshoer, and uh, a great guy. <clears throat> He's making biscuits all over. <laughs> now they look in, they're pretty neat, and they go right in there. This photograph, like every photograph should, has a lot of information. You can tell it's a wet day because he's been on the ground. Look at the tip of the toe. You know he's been walking around in grass because look at the little pieces of grass in the spur button. And of course, you know he's a young man. Look at those jingle bobs on the spurs. The older fellows don't need to bother with them. The younger fellows, it draws a gal's interest. <clears throat> this was on the front of the Prior Mountains. I was helping some people move cattle there, and I love it. This is really stringing them out. One rider. I just love that. Ah, uh, this is what I call luck. I got my shot here of the storm and the horses moving along. There's a fence line there. That's why they are moving so clearly that way. But then there was the lightning. I just love it when those things happen. Here, we're moving on the way to the guest ranch, which is over this ridge. We have to go down here, go up a trail, and then drop down on the other side. But somebody had not opened a gate soon enough, and these horses went to a completely different area, and I thought, I know where they are. And I went over there. They've been to a gate over here, which is where they're headed now, and it was closed. So they went back and were just grazing, and then um, I saw them, went down, opened the gate, came back, and started them moving in this direction, and I always had a camera with me, and I thought, ooh, the mountains, that's a great shot with the horses. So I made one shot. I've always made one shot until I got into digital, and then I've gotten a, my fingers a little heavy, and I'll end up getting several shots when, in the old days, I only got one. And I learned that because I had to take my film to cold drug to be developed, and it cost money. And I didn't get an allowance. I could dicker with dad to do certain things and would get paid for certain work like tearing down a sheep shed or something like that and I think he came out on top in terms of uh, what I got paid ah yeah. uh, yes <clears throat> here's one of the wranglers up at the ranch just topping off a horse in the spring we always had to do that Lots of fun uh, for the photographer. <laughs> He's got a lot of air there. <laughs> but he made it. He got back in the buggy there. And this one I call appreciation. It's a young fella. This is on the Great Montana Centennial Cattle Drive. And he just was expressing some appreciation to his horse. He said, it's my favorite one. <laughs> now I'm having a senior moment. I cannot remember his name right now. Esp. Hank Esp. That's it. 
unfortunately, he's gone now. This was down at the Montana Centennial Cattle Drive and the rope corral in the mornings. He was one of the really good ropers that would rope out um, each person's mount. And there were, let's see, two drovers from each of the 56 counties. So there were a lot of horses that had to be roped out in the morning. You couldn't go in there and get your own. You had to just say which one was yours, and they'd rope it for you. Again, this is from the Centennial Cattle Drive I just loved how you saw this long string of cattle. There were uh, almost 3,000 head. They were all a mixed herd. But I tried to photograph it much as it might have been or to make it look like the old days. But it was very hard with all of the riders. Even this one that I call Look It Good. They're looking good. He's looking good. This is kind of an accidental shot. I rode by and I saw this with the, the trees here framing this picture. And I thought, well, I made one shot. But there wasn't anything more than just the cattle. Then all of a sudden this rider appeared and I just swung around in the saddle and made a shot kind of over my shoulder, if you will. And I really like it, even though this is a little bit soft and not as sharp as I would like. Oh, light. That's what photography is about. And look at these shadows. This happens to be down in New Mexico. There's so much beauty in ranching, you know, really. Well, I don't think this little guy thinks there's too much beauty. He's getting a little education from his dad right then and there. He was six years old, and you can tell by the set of his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And this is <clears throat> a shot of when we were running horses up to the ranch in the spring. Well, it's not really in the spring. It was in June. We had to wait for the snow to melt up in the mountains. And I love this shot. I was galloping along. And I know one of the beauties of a telephoto lens is it blows up the things in the distance and makes them much larger. And I want a Big Timber and Crazy Peak there to appear much larger. They were so beautiful with the amount of snow on them. So I moved down through this little coulee onto this side and then set my telephoto to push. But since I was galloping along, I have my shutter speed at 200, 2 thousandths of a second, and I was using Tri-X, which is what you have to do. I love to shoot from on horseback, but it took me a little while to get the technique down. This is my sister Carol with our stallion, Sam, and I just, I call it horse whispering because you can tell he's paying attention to what she's saying. This is up in the Missouri breaks. <clears throat> I was with Mike Smith and his family, and I, it's just so beautiful, the cottonwoods down here. It all turns yellow. And they ran cattle in a big gathering, and they had come up there to gather a bunch of cattle and then get their own out. Oh, you don't see this anymore, do you, really? But I photographed these horses down in the middle of uh, Wyoming um, outside of Riverton. I was photographing a ranch girl, and 
her family really, they hardly ever went to town except for church at the sale yard. It was kind of cowboy church. And uh, to buy salt, sugar, and gas. And uh, they did everything with teams of horses. And it was so nice to see that again. I think I photographed this in 2000 and either 2001 or 2002. I got some elevation, didn't I? I was on horseback and I had a little hill under me so I could look down. I like the composition here of the V shape here that brings your eye into it. This I call cow country, and this is down helping Kramers move some cattle. And I just love it the way the cattle are moving this way. And look how the clouds are kind of coming down a V. Compositionally, I think this is, again, a very strong photograph. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Well, this is a simple one, might rain. This is a more ve recent photograph that I call Fall Pleasures. Look at that grass. Look at it. Talk about fall feed. And these cattle are looking so nice. And it's a beautiful day. And it's late October. <laughs> unlike what we have now. <laughs> and this I find also a very strong photograph because of the angle coming off the hill with the single rider up here. It just called looking good for shipping. Oh. I was photographing at another ranch and I saw this. This is part of my Women Ranchers series. <laughs> you know he chews snooze, look at it. <laughs> and his wife's on the back there along with a neighbor to help feed hay. This is a favorite shot of mine, <clears throat> and it's a reason why I use a tele or zoom lens, because I could stand well away from this little heifer and photograph the fact that this ranch woman's having to pull the calf. If I had moved, look at her eye, if I had moved that cow, would have gotten right up. And I would not have had the beautiful picture here of the placenta being broken and she's pulling the calf out and the calf's nose is free to breathe. I think it's, I really like it also because she's using a rope and not chains the way so many people do today. This is a mother-daughter, and uh, the father, husband's right over here. He was trained as a vet and then left it to ranch. And this is a, a cow with a prolapsed uterus. And it, that's his daughter. Clean that cow's uterus up, put it back in, stitch her back up, and then kind of keep an eye on her. This is, I call this calving lot footwear. <laughs> the only thing that's really clean are those spurs there. <laughs> this is down in, uh, in uh, Wyoming, very close to the Colorado line. <clears throat> and this woman, Polly Dickinson, is from this ranch, the Vermilion Ranch, you notice the rosary right here. And she said her grandmother had 
always carried a rosary wrapped around her saddle horn. She said, I lost 40 of them out in that country. <laughs> but she said, nothing ever happened to me. So she's a great believer in that. Here we have the family uh, with the calf here and giving it oxygen. It's, it's a tough thing. This is a sister and a brother. This is a ranch woman. I really like this photograph because back here is the old wood-burning stove and a pot of coffee, not quite finished in the background. Over here you've got the electric stove and there's a pot of soup there, and inside the stove was a cheese sandwich going. She's a no-nonsense ranch woman, in case you didn't guess that. Long, long-time rancher in northern New Mexico, uh, very highly regarded, um, and really works with a lot of organizations, ranching organizations, and to help kids get into it and really move professionally in ranching and ranch organizations. Oh, those of you who know Jane Glenny, got to be a few here from over around uh, Martinsdale, Harleton. No? Well, that's Jane. She's no longer with us. Typical there of the kind of work most ranchers are stuck with, paperwork. Somebody has to do it. Jane could do it inside, and she could also do it out. Down in central New Mexico, <clears throat> oh, they've got a lot of mesquite, and they've got a lot of just brushy country, and they're kind of spare on grass. They, you know, they figure a section will run uh, probably 32 head of cow-calf. That's not much. But uh, I, this woman and her husband uh, were gathering a number of sections. They did not use helicopters, <clears throat> which a lot of people use today because it's faster. Um, and they did not want to hire day help to do it. Again, I got this time on a windmill, which I don't advise. <laughs> I, do, I do not like heights, but I wanted to get the shot of the overview of these corrals that were kind of made, it looked to me like a cut-in-half railroad tie. Uh, I know you can't cut that stuff in half once it's treated, but... It was something like that. This is called the Jornada del Muerto, the journey of death. It's central southern New Mexico. And this woman and her husband, Jane and uh, Ben Kane, ranch there. This is double duty. This is typical of ranch women. <coughs> They're shipping this day, and she has brisket in the oven there. And she had been helping to push cattle into the uh, scales because they had the brand inspector there. They had the uh, truckers there to haul the cattle, and they had a lot of friends and neighbors to help gather the cattle. She just came in just briefly. And we have women shoeing horses. This is a, a really capable little woman. She's shorter than I am, which is going some. But she is a mover and a shaker. She, I photographed her just in northern uh, Wyoming, outside of Pinedale, 
And now she and her husband live outside of uh, Hysham and ranch there. I could not, I never pose people to make photographs, but Melody was constant motion, and finally I said, Melody, could you just, whoa, just a minute and let me get this photograph? So I got it, but I'm really sorry I didn't have a reflector to bounce some light, more light in back there. Well, the hired man had a load of cake, and he tried to go through this little dip. And he got the truck stuck, and it was chained up, but got the truck stuck, and then it froze. And Melody was going to pull it out. But when I saw the springs on that truck go like this, I said, I think you better wait or you're going to break something. So she said, well, we'll just unload it and I'll wait for the thaw. So she did. She used teams of horses. She had uh, four, four horses, two teams that she dearly loved and took with her. She also could use uh, heavy machinery, too. She knew how it worked. I, my hat's off to her. I, I wish I'd learned more of that from my granddad. But she loved to use her team and to feed the old way. And a cream separator. Now, I have to say, I thought lots of women that I photographed surely would be milking cows. I have to tell you, out of the 50 women I photographed and interviewed, only two had a cow, just one cow. And that just amazed me. Kitty gets a drink, too. Now, here's a case of a low angle that really gives impact to this woman rather than standing up to be eye to eye with her. Uh, she's from a large family in northern New Mexico, and she also happens to be a lawyer specializing in <laughs> land, property, and water rights. Ooh, that's the kind of lawyer you want in your family if you're a rancher. <clears throat> this is one of her, her sister who is kind of in charge of the horse operation on the ranch. And uh, I think maybe that, that old pony's about to give in and agree to whatever she wants. She also castrated all of the uh, stud horses on the ranch, but castrated them when they were two years old. They did not let them get older. There's a lawyer on a misty, misty morning. A girl who married the oldest boy is a crackerjack roper, got both hind legs and dragging him to the fire. Now, you mustn't just rope one leg. If you do, I grew up here and oh, shake it off. You got to have both feet if you're going to drag it to the fire. And she takes a break to feed her little daughter. This was a part of what I wanted people to know about ranch women. And my mother is the one who set me on this project. She just happened to say one day when I was complaining about a project that didn't fly with Johnny Jonkowski, a uh, two-time world champion bull rider, Mother said, well, why don't you photograph ranch women? Thank you, Mom, because this has really become quite a project. Thank you for giving us a voice. And another reason I did it is because every 
Eastern guy who came out west had to photograph the cowboys as if there were no women. They never referred to them as ranchers because they didn't even know the term, I don't think. But uh, they completely ignored the women. And to me, that was not fair. Growing up on a ranch, and I saw how many of the ranch women uh, worked outside with their husbands or their fathers or their brothers. <clears throat> Here's a woman uh, in Nevada who uh, was raising commercial Herefords as well as uh, the commercial Herefords and the purebreds. This is one of her purebred bulls. She wasn't a big woman anyway. Very well educated, very involved in promoting uh, beef and ranching in Nevada. She was also, uh, well, she had debuted in front of the King and Queen of England. Her father was in the military and she traveled all over the world and that's how she happened to debut there. And she married uh, a fella, I guess, in uh uh, Nevada, and she said he was a bachelor when I married him, and he was a bachelor when I divorced him. <laughs> <laughs> and then she married an old time Mustang hunter, and she had a wonderful life with him. But she was taking care of her purebred cattle. Nobody branded them, nobody vaccinated them, nobody earmarked them but her. And there she was this day, <clears throat> her dog Chica, and her horse Timmy, and she just loaded him in the back of a pickup there. And then she went off to work cattle so I could photograph her working cattle. And this is my sister Shelley, my middle sister, and her daughter Paige. They're at the ranch when they are moving horses, just seeing the back ends of the horses. Here they are, and it's a family affair with uh, her, two of her sons, uh, and a daughter, and herself. And she runs a hay baler. This is a young woman uh, who, in Nevada again, who wanted to buy, she and her husband wanted to buy his father's ranch, and uh, a part of the way that she raised money was to cut wood and drive 70 miles on before she could get to an asphalt road, a highway, uh, to sell the wood. A little fencing. Waddy Mit this was Waddy Mitchell's wife. Did anybody know Waddy Mitchell? Cowboy poet? Okay. Well, I think Waddy wanted me to photograph him. So she was finishing stitching a uh a duster for him, and he was waiting in the corner of the room until she finished, and then he was going to go out and show her how, and me, I guess, how to fence, and I had to tell him nicely that I was there to photograph her, not him. <laughs> and this is... Um, uh, Bobby Kramer, I uh, don't know if anybody knows her, Bobby's gone, but she was a legendary cattlewoman and a uh, horsewoman from down outside of Jordan, Montana. And this is on the Great Montana Centennial Cattle Drive with about 3,000 head. And they're just holding them at noon, and they circle the wagons and then fed all of the uh, drovers. Oh. 
Now, this is a photograph I'm really proud of, and it happens to be just almost accidental. She threw the loop, it caught that calf, he felt it, leapt up in the air, he's airborne. Does she look? No, she knows she caught him, so she's riding to the fire. Look at her hand, and look at her face. I just love it when you have professionals like that. <laughs> and this was down in New Mexico again, and uh, on a family ranch. And I was so surprised. These people rope all their, well, they'd say maybe rope anywhere from 15 to 20 head of calves, and they tie them down, tie all four feet together. And when they get 25, or I mean 15 or 20 of them tied up like that, then everybody gets off horseback, and they brand, dehorn, uh, vaccinate, uh, castrate, um, everything. And then when they finish each calf, they turn it loose, and then they get back on their horses again and do it all over. I was so surprised. I'd never seen that before. It's all a difference of how people do things. Here you can see some of them. Nobody's on horseback. They're all working on the ground. Now... <laughs> This ranch woman is from uh, Arizona, and just look at her belt buckle. Boss. <laughs> Make no mistake, she was the boss, but she had such a good sense of humor. And I like this shot down uh, around uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico, with the white horse here and a neighbor who stopped to ask this woman uh, who was, I don't know what she was doing down there, but uh, I think she had a horse and was gathering cattle, I believe. But the neighbor stopped, so she talked to him. And I just thought it was a very interesting kind of a shot with this white horse here, this formation, that line, the neighbor in there, and an obvious feminine person conversing with him. Now, this is a part of my series on ranch girls. This family had seven children when I photographed them. They were all homeschooled. Uh, they had horses to do everything. And I talked about them earlier outside of Riverton, Wyoming. <clears throat> I had a huge building that the father had insulated and run pipes around so they could have fresh produce all year long. It, it, they were totally self-sufficient. And when I called him to see how the girl, how his old, the girl I photographed was doing, who is now married, uh, she would be, it was about 18 years ago, uh, uh, they had two more children. Here she is chopping ice. And you have the younger girl in the background who's making butter. She takes peanut butter, empty peanut butter jars puts the cream in there when it's ready to go to butter, and then she rolls it back and forth like this while she's watching her sister take uh, <laughs> baler twine and uh, make rugs out of it for the house, for the entranceway to the house. They did not waste anything. They had no TV. They had a monitor and watched religious uh, movies on Sundays. She had her own room. She had an old-time singer sewing machine, the treadle type. And she made a lot of things for the family. She sewed everything. 
Grace. Yeah. Every so often it works right. <laughs> and uh, they fed corn uh, out there to the cattle. Why they fed it on bare ground, I don't know. I think I'd have had uh, troughs, so you saved more of the curdles. But there were four girls, and they were workers. They had to shovel uh, the uh, corn into the wagon, and then they take it out and feed it to the cattle. And I was down there in January. It's pretty crisp weather and some snow on the ground. This is an in-holding uh, sheep ranching in the corner of uh, Utah, Colorado, and I think Wyoming, roughly, outside of, outside, or in-holding in, in Dinosaur National Monument. A lot of sheep. You know, these ranches out west, a lot of them were built on sheep. Then when people made enough money, they went to cattle, and they don't want to admit what <laughs> funded them to get into cattle, which always amazes me. I, I don't quite understand that. But maybe I don't because my granddad had 3,000 head of sheep, too. This gal is helping with the inoculations. Here, if you look carefully, you can see her rifle scabbard because they had to, she had to be out there riding to watch the sheep from uh, coyotes. Who's got chickens anymore? And she, uh, this girl, was also quite a mechanic. I've got a lot of respect for that when they can be mechanics, too. This girl is now, <laughs> she's grown up, she's got a child of her own now. Where does the time go? She helps her mother here, doctor a little uh, filly. Here she's training her sheep, but I really love this photograph because that one sheep that's kneeling down. Yes, mass mistress, yes, mistress. <laughs> she had quite a time training the sheep. This is over uh, on the east side of the mountains, uh, outside of Polson, Montana, a ranch family there. This gal and her brother are out moving some horses, feeding the bum calves here. She's a very active young woman in 4-H. She plays basketball. She's computer savvy, and uh, she's quite a hunter, too. Okay, we go to a little bit of quick... Or, am I boring you? No. Okay. A uh, little rodeo here, and this is some experimental work called panning, where you move the camera with the action, and you have a slow shutter speed, but you get rid of all the faces in the crowd, in the background. The ropes here, there's always something that's relatively clear in a shot where you pan. And that's, you see the motion here where he is stopping the horse, pulling it back. Again, we get rid of the crowds back there, but it looks like this steer has really substantial horns, and he's just got the small horns strapped on. Ah, oh, Daddy's a rodeoing man. Is over at um, Miles City, bucking horse sale. 
Daddy's a bronc rider, too. This is a photograph that really got me into <clears throat> a little series on rodeo as dance. Look at the man's hand, how gentle it is. His hand up here is caught in the bareback rigging. He rosined it too much and he couldn't get it loose. And here the horse's leg is across the front, his front, on the shafts, and it just struck me as a kind of dance, a rugged one, but a kind of dance. This was down here at uh, Big Timber. Look at the hands here, how graceful they are. <clears throat> and this rope just slips right through. Here you have two guys, this is in Big Timber, competing in the bronc riding, but they're, this one is bandaging the other fella, trying to secure his soul, shoulder so that he can ride again. And uh, I just love the idea of the competitiveness, but also the friendship and the willingness to help. This is simple rodeo wannabe. Look at that hand. And the. <laughs> Look at these hands, how sensitive and strong they are. This is a Navajo artist. And I just, I just thought it was a very interesting shot. This is a woman who's in the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. She's from Idaho, Jan Yoren. Uh, I, this was taken down at Nile, and I was in the arena photographing, and she drew this big old Palomino gelding. Uh, he, he was a first-rate bucker. And uh, I was making the photographs, and all of a sudden the horse turned toward me. So I thought, ooh, I better get my shot and get out of here. And I had a flash, and I set the flash off at the same time. So here we've got these, this mane going and that mane up there going, too. But look how she's got her heels set in that horse's shoulders. And here's the rigging for bareback, bareback bronc rigging. Just fit in the ride, but again, with panning, so you eliminate the faces in the audience, all that distracting kind of material. <laughs> Opposites don't attract. <laughs> Ooh, this is in Harleton. That was probably the wettest <laughs> Fourth of July I can ever remember seeing. Now, this moves into Baja, California. Are you really interested in this, or do you want me to whip through it? Whip through it? No. No, okay. <laughs> All right. This is the Spanish Missionary Trail. This is the clearest description of it. Most of the trails, and that's a loose term, trail, are kind of like this. But in this one area, you can really see it. Um, it is mule country. It is not horse country. It's rugged country with deep canyons and steep rugged trails, but it also is beautiful country. You just want to know where the water holes are. This is a Bujam tree, also called the Cereal. It's a fascinating kind of thing. 
I was down there. I made, I think, uh, eight trips down there and camped, traveled by mule and camped. You don't use tents. You don't need them. You just spread your tarp out in the ground and uh, leave your sleeping bag rolled up, though. Don't open it until you want to climb in because you might have company in there you don't want. Ah, yes, they just turn the mules loose, and then they kind of drive them behind. The mules are supposed to find the trail. It's a very interesting (laughs) situation. And this is called the cardone, not the saguaro. They call it a cardone down there. Yeah, here you are. Here's a trail. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I wasn't going to ride a mule across that, poor thing. Now, here's a high-tech cooking in Baja. This is the low. This is medium. And that's high. And there's a steel plate across the top. And it's typical. It's typical how they cook, and they really can cook on this. And these are the alforjas, or uh, another senior moment for uh, (laughs) panniers. Thank you. Panniers, but they call them alforjas down there. And they just have things hanging outside. This is the saddle shed here, basically. Look at the adobe, and then down here, somewhere I have another shot that shows the uh, uh, fact that they twisted the uh, stuff that went between these blocks to give it a little nicer look, anything to make things a little more beautiful. This is how they moved water down from a spring quite high in the mountain above. They had to cut this all and then arrange it. They don't have much in the way of wildlife that would disturb these rocks or anything and knock this trough of water off. Here, they have taken the uh, cactus, they've cut off all of the uh, stickers, barbs, and now they are chopping it up because it has a lot of moisture in it to feed these animals because they didn't have any water at this place. There's a drought. This is how they tan their leather. They have a, just a hide here, and then they fill it with water, and they take the bark of the various trees, the Palo Verde uh, and the mesquite, chop it up and put it in there, and the tannic acid that comes from the tree bark is what tans the hides. But the hides are at least... Uh, a quarter of an inch thick, if not thicker. You don't get any lightweight hides down there. This is his daddy. And he's just watching. They're getting ready to pack up for the day. When I was down there, there was such a drought in one area, and we came on dead, mummified cattle all over the place. Uh, It was really sad because that's their whole livelihood. Many of them went to goats. They milk the goats and then make cheese and then haul that into the nearest town, which was usually quite a ways away, and sell it. That was the only way of surviving. And we would ride into ranchos. They used to always say, stop, come in, get off, water your animals, come in, have some coffee. And they would give us fresh goat cheese, 
and coffee. Uh, lovely people in the rural areas. Here you have the difference between the traditional Baja saddle here and uh, a Baja boy who has gone American. Not yet with the head stall and the bridle, but... And here's the blinder that he slipped down over that mule's eyes when he went to get on him. Then once he was on him, he could reach up and pull the blind off and take a deep seat in a short rein. And here's what's happened. They want to be more American. This is the armas, or uh, what's known as shaps in our vernacular. Uh, they happen to have a tapadero on, covering on the stirrup. Look at that. That's an old-time bear trap fork on that. And a nice little saddlebag on the back there. This, we also went to the area of the Grand Caves, these gorgeous cave paintings that are now so protected you can hardly get in. But when I was there, we were able to walk right in, look at everything, no fences, no wires, nothing. And here our guide was showing us where the painters had mixed the pigments, usually black, red, uh, white, and yellow, to do these paintings here of the vultures, the deer, and there are also people shaman that are somewhere around 15 to 20 feet tall. So they presumed that the painters, the early painters, built a kind of ladder to get up there to do the work. Now, this is what the padres made the natives do so that the padres' mule wouldn't stumble. Look at that. Imagine that. You're down in that country. I think I just wander around till I found a little better place with good footing. I think those mule have suction cups on their feet anyway. Cheerful, cheerful young men, and we see them all the time down there in Baja. Here are the armas, the shaps big, heavy, thick things, and they tie their bedding on the back, and then they usually have a coffee pot, and they're set. It's just a beautiful church. It does not look like this anymore. Uh, Santa Gertrudis Mission, uh, Holy Water Font, this, the win wooden windows there, it's all been modernized. It's change, progress. Don't you just hate it? <laughs> and here's the woman who was the keeper of the keys to that church. Look at Christ, he's got an apron on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> very, very religious. And this, I had to make this photograph right there. Every other photograph of a Baja Rancho family I made, the men were either had a arm up on his wife's shoulder, not, no holding hands, nothing with an arm around his wife's waist or anything. So when I saw this man take his wife's hand, I thought, I have to make that photograph. And that's a goodbye to Baja. Now, you know what this is. Could you see him up there? 
That's a shot by the light of the moon. Now, I like black and white. <clears throat> Color is so seductive. Black and white keeps you on the straight and narrow. Color leads you astray. And I simply call this, this is my nephew Rocco, uh, who's a first-rate rancher, and I call this a quiet night under the Big Dipper. And you can see a few of these cows just bedded down. This is in October again. <laughs> Typical October. This is another, again, moonlight shot only with the light of the moon. There's nothing else. And here she is leading this horse. There were a few stars here, but the clouds were moving in, unfortunately. Handsome mountains, aren't they? Home, to me anyway. This was taken down on the east slope of the Prior Mountains here, the full moon over here. It was taken right about this time, around the 30th, 31st of October or the 1st of November. And I really like this photograph because you could see the grasses, you could see my prairie teepee, uh, the leaves there. And then over here, you can see the sagebrush. I, you know, moonlight's beautiful. And if you just wait a little while until your eyes adjust to it, it's quite extraordinary, I think. This is another of this series. And this is it's call I call it when the day herd or when the night herder's day begins because you can see it here. And those stars are beginning to fade along here. And this was the very first shot I ever made in this series. Those are the crazies. Okay, <clears throat> one of the joys of the telephoto lens is uh, what it does. It blows up when you move it to a telephoto segment, pull things in. It blows them up. And I knew that, and I wanted this scene of horses being moved on the ranch to have the clouds look so big. So I was on horseback and I moved all around to see where I could get this effect. And I finally got it. I've also done some etchings. I take my negative and I work on it in Photoshop to get the effect of etching. I cannot draw, paint, or any of that, which is, I'm really, I feel handicapped because I can't do it. So if I can do something with photography that enables me to get that effect, I mean, I would love to be able to draw that freehand. This is called Tide Hard and Fast. As my granddad said, if it's worth roping, it's worth keeping. So he always tied hard and fast. And I've got all my thumbs, so I never learned how to <laughs> dally rope. <laughs> I titled this one, Not In It For The Money. And that's ranching. Dally. Again, it's the etching. Taking this image that I worked on in Photoshop, transferring it onto a copper plate, 
with a photo resist, which takes the image, and then it is, quote unquote, developed in acid to be etched. And then that is washed and dried. I had to do test strips of the etching to get it deep enough, but not too deep, with the uh, oil on it. And then I ro rolled the oil on it and then took the dampened paper, put that on top with some mats and ran it through, hand cranked it through a press and got these as prints. This is a cyanotype, not using any silver to achieve this at all, but it's an old time shot using just cyan to get this blue effect. And you, these are very slow uh, uh, chemicals to respond to light. So they had to be placed in a frame with the negative and then exposed to sunlight. And of course, like anything, you can't just guess what the length of the time should be. Is it high noon? Is it winter? Is it fall, spring, summer? When is it? So you had to do, I had to do test strips and then mark them until I got the effect that I wanted. This is using salted paper in which I use a solution of salt with chemicals that are light sensitive. But it's not silver. It's not silver. Castletown here. Ah, so many of these buildings are no longer there. I photographed it for 40, 45 years now, on and off. Uh, and this is down at Crow Agency for the big fair in August when they used to just insist you have TP, no wall tents, no automobiles, nothing like that. You had to have horses, but now it's changed. They're a lot more permissive, and it lacks a lot of the kind of authenticity. Oh, yeah, you can chase them forever, and I did in Utah until finally one still was operating when I got out of the truck with my camera and could make the picture. Dust devil. But isn't it a nice, neat dust devil? I mean, it's pretty messy down around here. Uh, one of my favorite shots, this is of Lippas on her horses. I'm very fond of this one because look at the symmetry there and the heads and the chests. And <clears throat> this photograph I made down in Santa Fe, uh, this group of Lipizzaners was performing there in the college gymnasium. And I thought, oh, heck, I don't have to take a zoom lens. I can talk my way. I can t let somebody let me get in close to them. Well, <laughs> I shouldn't be so cocky because I couldn't talk anybody into anything but stay in your seat. And so I made the shots, but for the first time in my life, I had to crop these photographs. And I do not believe in cropping in the dark room or even in the light room now. You should crop in the viewfinder, but I couldn't help it. So I had to crop this. They had a ratty old blue velvet curtain behind these horses. You could see the folds, and it just, it looked terrible. Uh, they had Viennese waltz music. It was beautiful. Uh, and then you had the riders, but... Uh, 
what I did do to achieve the effect is I went very high contrast. I used the highest contrast and number three paper. These were all printed on silver. And I uh, then used straight Dectol to be as high contrast as I could. And it made the horses whiter it made the entire background just fall off into black. And this light down here kind of balances the epaulets of the rider up there. Ah. Luck, <laughs> luck, luck is awfully good to me. I have tried for years to get this photograph. And I happened to get very lucky. And usually the horses are all over the hill by the time the lightning strikes. But in this case, it didn't happen that way. So I got the shot. And I've always been very happy with it. It's a, almost a sold-out shot. Just the little things down along by the creek out at the ranch. The beauty of the ice crystals. Frost on the windows. And I didn't, I tell you, I don't do anything to things. I just am terribly happy if I see them and photograph them. Frost forest again. It's just a window sill window out at the ranch, but in this case, it was really covered with the frost. And again, it's just a case of looking, looking, looking. Just slow down. What do you think I should title this one? Do you see it? I almost called it uh, Winter's Wolf, and then I thought, no, I can't direct people to see that. Let's see if somebody doesn't come up to me and say, did you know that that snow looks like a dog? <laughs> And this has a contrast. This looks like a back, I think. It's just snow. And then we have the barbed wire fence. I like how you can see body forms or portions of the human body in snow when it lies out deep enough. And... I know this will come as a surprise to everybody in Livingston when you don't have wind. <laughs> I don't know where you have to go to get it just lying there still, but it can be so beautiful. And this I still don't understand. I set off, I wanted to see what it would look like. I had my camera, and I think it was a knicker mat then, and I had a flash on it, and so I just set it off to see what the snowflakes would look like. Look at how they're all square. It has to be something associated with the uh, shutter. <coughs> this was with a big 4x5 camera. And these people, this couple, never saw me setting up. And I had a tripod and I had a black cover, as you have to have when you're using a view camera. And they never saw me. And I just, I just love the fact that humans are so small in front of something so massive. Oh, the littlest things can be the biggest things. The most, uh, I don't want to say transparent, but not solid. 
I really like this photograph for some reason. It kind of reminds me of my dad saying about, oh, she had her head thrown back like the lid on a coffee pot. <laughs> it kind of looks a little bit like that to me. And one of the many things I like to show is a relationship of the human to the bigness of our land and how lucky we are here in Montana to still have so much beauty and so much open country uh, without a lot of things, without a lot of people. And <clears throat> this is just a, I call it a different point of view. It's just a piece of grass. But it looks a little bit, a little bit like a horse head or a uh, seahorse. It just depends upon if you're just walking along and looking and imagining. This is definitely that. Snow had just driven it on these little pieces of grass, and I just call it winter hikers, although this guy's got a problem right there. <laughs> but he's little, so. Uh, this is my sister Shelley, and I really like the relationship between the sun and the long streak, the horse and the long shadow. I can't imagine people asking me, as so many said, where is that sand dune? <laughs> and I said, it's not sand, it's snow. And look at how deep it is on that horse, uh, hock deep and drifted. So it was tough traveling, which happens to be the title of that work. Now, we're always taught that an S-curve is something you should try to maintain in photographs. A little bit of an S-curve, but it makes it more interesting, I think. This is from the Great Montana Centennial Cattle Drive. This was just right outside of Big Tuber here off Howie Road. I call it a natural design. And I just, I was photographing a friend's horses, and the third time I was out there to photograph them, because I was looking for clouds <laughs> like this. I love clouds. And they just add so much to a photograph. And I saw the horses in that design. So I had to make the photograph and call it a natural design. At the, ca at the uh, Centennial Cattle Drive, I was on horseback, and I moved around until I could show these men. They were talking to their boss there, and he, they were his segundos, and I just wanted that kind of a triangular angle there. And this one I call uh, turning the point. But look how the eye goes down here. You drop into this little coulee draw, and you pick it up and go on down. The eye just does it. And that's one of the wonderful things about photography or painting, but photography because we can't alter things too much, or if we do, we should tell it. We should be honest. Uh, but here we go down. Again, it's on the east side of the Prior Mountains. And I'm going to close with this because I love this angle. This is with brood mares. That, that, and a little bump down there. All of those little kinds of things about photography that make it so wonderful and so satisfying to me. Um, and I am so 
pleased that you were all here tonight. I hope you were not disappointed. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now. Thank you for listening and seeing. Questions? Yes. Uh, what, uh, how wide did your setting have, does your setting have to be to do those moonlight shots? Oh, let me tell you. The moonlight shots, that was shot with a Canon uh, EOS 5D Mark II. I set my ISO, which is sensitivity to light, at 1250 because I did not want noise, which is the equivalent of grain in film. And then I did a series of tests, and I ended up with a 12 and a half second exposure time. That's wide open. Any other questions?